So I am far and away a traditionalist when it comes to violin making. I'd say 95% of my tools and techniques are hyper-traditional, very historically accurate. And because of that, when you play a Lethbridge violin, it feels familiar. It's something you're accustomed to. It's not something you need to sort of relearn and combat. Uh, the one thing I do differently, and this is my copy of the 1729 Defau Stradivarius, which is very interesting as far as Strads go, because it's got nearly a plain maple back with some very visible medullary rays, which is sort of a nice subtle contrast that the plain maple people are more accustomed to. But what I do differently is I make a honeycomb pattern channel in the neck, and then a little channel in the back of the fingerboard as well, which not only alleviates a lot of the neck weight, so you don't need to push up and combat it while you're playing as much, which means you get less wrist and finger strain, so it's nicer to play. But it also makes a little channel of air in the neck, which resonates at the same frequency as the instrument, and therefore maximizes harmonic overtones. It's very pleasant. I enjoy it a lot. It's a nice little subtle touch that I do. Enjoy! So here are five quick tips for buying intermediate professional quality violin, and there's two more in-depth ones below. First of all, buy from a string shop or a luthier. Big box music stores do not have the time to dedicate to properly setting up a violin, so it's going to be an extra expense down the road. Second of all, if they're going to cut corners, it'll be very visually apparent in the fingerboard, because ebony's hard to work, so I usually use the fingerboard as a metric for the rest of the instrument. The end should be tapered. If it's still like a quarter of an inch thick, it means they've just slapped on a blank and called it a day. If they've cut corners, we don't cut corners. The underside should also be as black as the top, otherwise they've dyed some cheap inferior wood, which will wear out quickly and require redressing within six months. Not cheap. Not worth it. The bridge should be shapely, have character, and perfectly fit the top. If it's still boxy like this, it means they slapped a blank on, still cut corners. Lastly, the finish. Should have brush marks, should have little imperfections. If it's perfectly glossy or perfectly matte, it's a spray-on polyurethane, which is too hard, doesn't sound good, and breaks the wood pretty quickly. Humidity. These two are a little more in-depth. These are especially applicable to shopping in person, but with decent pictures and descriptions, also applicable to online shopping. First of all, the purfling. You want to make sure it's an actual inlaid, three-ply stripe of purfling, and not just two black lines drawn onto the top. The easiest way to do this is to look at the grain of the spruce, and make sure it does not continue into the white stripe of the purfling. Uh, if it does, you've got two black lines drawn on, which isn't providing any structural support, although it still looks pretty. A little more roundabout, but also the weight of the instrument. Any decent luthier or string shop should list the weight without chin rest. You want less than 430 grams. I aim for 400. This one's 396. Some factory instruments can weigh up to 600 grams because they don't want to spend the time removing as much material from the top or back plates, which means not only is it heavier and therefore causing more shoulder and wrist strain, but also it's dampening the vibrations because you've got to move more mass with the vibration of the strings, which means it won't sound as warm or open or free. There are some exceptions, but this is generally universally true. For sure, I think my favorite things to work on would be the scroll and the F-holes, because not only are they very sort of fine and delicate, which is in stark contrast to who I am as a physical being, but also because they present a lot of opportunity to imbue sort of subtle character to them that are representative of the maker. The questions I get the most is about the sound post. Specifically, what's the purpose of the sound post and how does the sound post work? For those unfamiliar, the sound post is a little spruce dowel that lives inside of violins, violas, and cellos. You can see it through your treble side F-hole. Here's a terrible, not nearly the scale drawing to help me explain. In the case of violins, violas, and cellos, your strings run from the tailpiece over the bridge down the fingerboard to either your finger in the case of a fingered note or the nut in the case of an open note. The rosin on your bow hair grips and releases the string anywhere from 300 times to 6,000 times per second, which is what sends the string vibrating, which is what makes sound. If the sound posts weren't there, the vibration of the strings would transmit from the bridge to the violin top, and it would vibrate just up and down like an acoustic guitar. With the sound post in place, it acts as both a fulcrum and a coupling. So the top of the violin will vibrate in either a sine wave or a cosine wave, with the sound post being the fulcrum, and because it's now coupled to the back plate as well, the back plate will vibrate at exactly the same frequency. This almost doubles the amplitude, which is why a tiny little violin is so much louder than a big old acoustic guitar. Science. I love questions like these, because this is one of the annoying answers in Luther e, where the answer is, theoretically, yes, in practice, no. So there are four different scientific principles at play here. Three of them are very sciencey wines, and would take like a 20-minute lecture. I'm trying to avoid those. I want to keep Luther e accessible. Luckily, the most easy to explain one is also the most significant contributing factor. So in any vibrating string, you've got two key points. You've got the point of transmission, where the vibration of the string is transmitted to the instrument itself, and the point of termination, where the string ends. In the case of a violin, it looks like this. Termination at the tailpiece, transmission at the bridge, termination at the nut or finger. However, on an acoustic guitar, the point of termination and the point of transmission are mechanically linked via the bridge plate. That looks like this. Termination and transmission at the bridge, the other termination is the fret or nut. Means acoustic guitars are very good at directly translating the electrical vibration of the strings into an up and down vibration of the top. Adding a sound post would mean you need to input twice as much energy because you're now vibrating two plates instead of one. 
With an elastic coupling between the top and back plates, like a big old pocket of air, it acts like a bellows, pushes the air and sound out through the sound. Today I'll be shooting three 60 second explainers for individual parts and components of the violin. Up first is the bridge. Now the bridge is a very tricky piece of violin geometry, and here's why. Because you want to remove as much material as possible from the bridge in order to minimize its weight, and therefore maximize its transmission of vibration from the string to the instrument. But taking that too far will yield a bridge that's very brittle, and therefore prone to warping or breaking. Which means you need to be very selective in not only the quality of wood, but also in how you shape it. From a big beefy blank like this, to something shapely and very lightweight, like is on the finished instrument. Additionally, the geometry of the bridge is a little counterintuitive. Because of the curvature at the top, the force is not being exerted straight down. It's being exerted at diagonals, much like this. Which means if you want to maximize, say, the output at the top end of the instrument, you want to remove weight from either the kidney, the heart, or the foot on the bass side, and not from the treble side. The bridge, like many of my newfound followers, is small but mighty and worthy of love. Almost universally, except for the very bottom of the barrel, every bridge you encounter is going to be made out of quarter sawn maple. Um, as someone who's shopping for an instrument, your best bet would be to look at grain orientation. So the medullary rays on the side facing the tailpiece should be lines that almost run straight up and down, whereas on the fingerboard side, the same medullary rays should look more like freckles or dots. And that's because most of the pull of the strings runs in this direction, so with the longer grain visible on this side, it'll better resist warping and breaking. And since it's still got some time to fill, if you hold the violin up to the light like this, you should see no light passing underneath the feet of the bridge, only around them. The side of the bridge facing the tailpiece should meet the top at exactly a 90 degree angle, while the other side should slope away from it. You can also check with a business card. But ultimately, having a new bridge fitted at a luthier should only be between like 45 and $60 or so, so it shouldn't be a deal breaker if the price is right. Though my approach in general is that a dollar spent at a luthier is worth at least $2 spent at a shop, so an $850 violin with a $150 luthier setup will serve you a lot better as a musician than a $1,000 violin from the shop. Today we're going to very quickly talk about varnish. First of all, it's important to differentiate varnish from finish as pieces of terminology. A finish is anything you put on wood that dries and provides layer of protection. A varnish is a finish, but varnish specifically refers to a combination of resins and gums dissolved in a solvent. There are two types of varnish, this oil varnish and spirit varnish. The resins and gums are the same in either spirit varnish that dissolved in wood alcohol and in oil varnish that dissolved in linseed oil. This is my spirit varnish recipe and you'll see it's almost indistinguishable from my oil varnish. Other than the solvent, the only difference is walnut oil, and that's because walnut oil is not soluble in alcohol, hence the omission. There's a misconception that oil varnish is objectively better than spirit varnish, and that's simply not the case. Once fully cured, one should be indistinguishable from the other. However, because spirit varnish takes a few days to dry, and oil varnish takes several weeks, any luthier willing to endure the agonizing dry time of oil varnish is probably more interested in the quality of the output than the quantity of it. So it's a very good metric by which to judge a luthier. So the only difference between a fiddle and a violin is the player and their technique. However, there are certain fiddle players, specifically of bluegrass and maritime fiddle music, who prefer a different setup for their instrument. I printed this at larger than scale for the sake of visual clarity, but the fundamental difference is the curvature at the top of the bridge. A violin will have a slightly steeper curve to provide better separation between the strings so you can more easily play one string at a time without accidentally hitting the adjacent string. Whereas a fiddle bridge will be a little flatter on the top, so you can more easily play two, three, or four strings at a time, which provides better access to drones as a player. That will very slightly detriment the complexity of tone, but I found, in general, fiddle players more prize clarity of tone over complexity of tone. Additionally, a fiddle bridge will sometimes be cut a little bit thicker than a traditional violin bridge. That's because fiddle players are more prone to using steel core strings, which are higher tension than synthetic or gut core strings of classical violinists. A little extra thickness helps prevent warping and breaking. As an aside, this is my copy of the Ex Madrileño Stradivarius, and it should be up in my shop next week. It's all about the pegs. So the peg box on very nearly every violin on the planet is made out of maple. It's important to keep in mind as a frame of reference for the different materials of pegs. About 90% of the pegs you'll encounter in the wild are made of one of three materials, either ebony, European boxwood, or Chinese boxwood, or jujube wood. Admittedly, some makers use either rosewood or pernambuco for their pegs. Those are both critically endangered lumber, so I avoid them like the plague. Ebony is very hard, very dense, and very resistant to changes in humidity. This makes it a very good choice for places like southern Ontario, where I am, where we've got very dry winters and very humid summers. However, it does wear out the peg box a little more quickly than the other woods. The red-brown European boxwood is very slightly softer than maple, and as such will not wear out the peg box to any appreciable extent. However, it's much more susceptible to changes in humidity. As such, this is what I recommend for more temperate climates, where your humidity is fairly consistent throughout the year. Last is the tan Chinese boxwood. It's very soft, very prone to splintering. I only recommend this for very base-level student instruments or fire. I can make this make sense. It's been a 14-hour workday, so I'm not quite as uh, mentally functional as usual. 
but basically just by virtue of friction from tuning, you're going to end up with a little bit of compression of the wood of either the peg or the peg box, no matter what. Uh, which is why every 200 play hours or six months for most players, less for concert performers, I recommend bringing your instrument in to be uh, maintained at a luthier or a string shop. What they'll do is they'll dress the pegs, which is just a very light shaving on a peg shaver, and they'll ream the hole slightly with a reamer, just to make sure the fit is maintained. What we're trying to avoid is a situation like this, where there's so much wear that the peg box will no longer physically accept the peg. In this case, you need to rebush the peg box, which consists of inserting a dowel, sawing off the dowel, re-drilling the peg holes, re-tapering the peg holes, and fitting a whole new set of pegs. A full rebush job will cost you up to $800. I'm a little more reasonable, but that's pretty average, whereas your semi-annual maintenance costs between $50 and $100. I think a maintenance is being like an oil change, where it would be nice to not have to do it, but doing it will save you a fortune in the long run. This is only part one. So last night I would mentioned semi-annual maintenance and how it ought to be done on all string instruments. I figured I'd quickly go through what that entails. First, there's a three-phase inspection process. There's a playing phase where I noodle around on it, make sure it sounds good, make sure it feels right under the fingers, and that the pegs will hold pitch without slipping or sticking. Then I'll do a visual inspection, where I make sure there's no cracks forming, no seams opening up, make sure your tailpiece is in an appropriate position, that your bridge is an appropriate height and thickness, and that it hasn't warped, cupped, or cracked, and that your fingerboard is nice and smooth and no divots dug into it from playing. Then I'll remove the chin rest, remove the tailpiece, strings, and bridge, Make sure there's no open seams that were hidden by the chin rest clamp, because that happens quite often. Make sure your sound post is in an appropriate position, hasn't been knocked off kilter. And then just double check everything a second time, and then clean it with a microfiber cloth and a gentle cleansing solution. Then I move on to the servicing phase. But that's part two. Part two. Obviously, the actual work required is going to vary significantly from instrument to instrument. Universally, I'll polish the fingerboard so it feels better under the fingers. I'll lubricate the nut and bridge to minimize the risk of string breakage. I'll redress the pegs to get them to fit perfectly without slipping or sticking, and quite often you have to slightly adjust the length of the tail gut. The Ciccone style tail guts, the nylon ones like these, tend to stretch a little over time. They're quick to adjust with the screws, but you want your string after length to be exactly one-sixth the playing length of your string to maximize harmonic overtones without introducing undue risk of developing wolf notes. From there I'll do any minor repairs that are necessary, open seams, sound post or bridge adjustments, uh, for any major repairs, like cracks that need stabilizing, I'll contact you first, so I'm not billing you for things you're not willing or able to pay for right then. And then I'll restring it, set it back up, and get it back to you. Now, I bill hourly for the amount of work involved, so a fiddle that's in fine fettle will only cost about $30 to get set up, whereas one that needs more work might cost 100 Anyways, this has... I'll be showing helpful resources behind me throughout this video, but I think luthery is one of those things that's a lot more intimidating to start than it is to do, because luthiers will talk about things like dendrology and chladney patterns and vibrational modes, and that's very intimidating. And those are all things that are important to grasp eventually, so you can consistently create instruments with a certain complexity of tone. But consistency and complexity do not matter for your first few builds, you know? Your first few are about learning and experimenting and making something with your own two hands that makes music. There's a magic in that. I went to the prestigious school of books and YouTubes. So my first few builds were firewood, and then my 18th won me the Spirit of Stradivari Award. You know, I'm a firm believer that luthery should be more accessible, because if you can make a birdhouse, and you can make mistakes without hating yourself for it, you're golden. You've got what it takes. If you can afford the financial investment of going to any of the violin-making schools in America, you know, good for you. Great. If you can afford the time investment of a traditional apprenticeship, wonderful. I just took on my first apprentice. You know, she's fantastic. I love her. Read, watch, reach out, realize there's power in fucking up. That's my name. So sometimes I get hate from other luthiers for oversimplifying or overgeneralizing violin making practices, and that's fair, you know. I know where you're coming from. You know, first of all, each luthier has like five opinions that all the other ones hate. That's just what happens when you're learning from experience. But second of all, you know, what I'm trying to do is demystify violin making and make it more accessible to the masses. This is not by any means something that will turn you from, you know, someone who's never handled lumber into a master luthier. That's not what I'm aiming for, that's not something I could achieve in 60 second bursts. Um, if you've never been on the ice before, just bought your first pair of skates, is your instructor going to teach you a quadruple axle, or are they going to teach you how to lace up, skate, and stop? If it was your first day in med school, would they teach you how to run an IV, or would they teach you how to do a coronary revascularization? You know, this is baby steps. This is literally painting the canvas so that you can start, you know, creating your own things and being your own person. Third of all, I'm doing okay. You know, TikTok is not the sum total of my knowledge. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Just thought I'd quickly introduce you to my apprentice. Hello! This is Grace. She's wonderful. <laughs> I love her. She teaches cello. She built her first violin. She's fantastic. It's She's got wonderful. got my name on it and everything. <laughs> I'm so clean. Anyways, I'm adopting her. <laughs>
I'm actually kind of surprised that hasn't come up more. Uh, there's two reasons for it, basically. One is that because gender identity is such a, you know, sort of elastic or non-concrete thing that can evolve over the course of your entire life and is equally valid, sort of no matter where you fall on the gender spectrum, I think it's just a lot more inclusive than words like dude or babe or whatever. And number two, and this is the more important one for me, is I want everyone to know that they've got at least one friend in the world, you know. As Sondheim wrote, no one is alone. Sorry, it's another long day, so i got to sort of work and talk at the same time. So the answer to this is frustrating to both aspiring luthiers and established luthiers, because there's no formal education required for becoming a luthier, and that's fine, because we can each, you know, take our own journey and wind up in the same place. But unfortunately, there's no sort of proof of skill required, or, uh, you know, final exam you have to sit. So in most of the world, as long as you provide a service to string instruments, you can call yourself a luthier, and unfortunately, tuning a single guitar string counts as providing a service to a string instrument. However, at the uh, bottom of the talent pile, you're not going to get many repeat customers. So you got to all sort of find your own journey through this. You know, I went to the school of books, YouTube, and fucking up. But there are, uh, you know, wonderful violin-making courses across the U.S. and Europe and Australia. And there's uh, always the traditional apprenticeship route, which, you know, I've just started taking on my first apprentice, and she's wonderful. I support you. In order to understand why your fine tuners are fucking up your tone, first you need to understand how a mute works. A mute is a little piece of rubber, plastic, or metal that clips onto your bridge, and its sole function is to add mass to the top of the instrument exerted as downward force. The more mass there is to move, the lower the amplitude of vibration will be for a given input of energy. So this not only reduces the overall volume of your instrument, but also muffles or subdues the harmonic overtones of it. Because the tailpiece free floats over the belly of the instrument, it too exerts a downward force on the bridge. So the more mass there is on your tailpiece, and the closer that is to the bridge, the greater the muting effect. E strings are finicky, so it's really hard to go completely without fine tuners, but with modern strings, the G and D be really easy to get to pitch just using the pegs, and the A string doesn't put up too much of a fight either. Even if you're completely relying on four fine tuners, there are far better options than these heavy little guys. Tailpieces with built-in fine tuners don't alleviate any weight, but they do at least move it further away from the bridge. Additionally, there are aluminium or titanium fine tuners that are about a third the weight of the steel or nickel ones that alleviate your issue somewhat as well, as would a thinner or lighter tailpiece. And that's why...